So welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Susan McIntosh, Director of Ciencia, and I'm delighted to see you all here and welcome you to this first lecture in our year-long series on failure. Now Ciencia has innovated this year by teaming up with Duncan College to offer a one-credit cor one course this semester organized around these lectures with additional discussions on failure that's going to take place in the Duncan Masters House, hosted by Duncan Masters, Marnie Hilton, and Luis Gunnar-Gockberg, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. And we, uh, we uh, are very uh, grateful to the Masters of Duncan for this collaboration, which we hope will be very productive. It looks like it might already be. How many of you here are associated with the Duncan College course, the Cog Cognitive Studies course? Raise your hands. All right, How, uh, are there uh, students here associated with other courses that encourage you to attend? Raise your hands. <laughs> all right, <laughs> excellent. Well, we're glad to have all of you here. Now, you may wonder where we came up with a theme such as failure. This theme was the product of discussions among the CNCA members and fellows. You can find a listing of all those names on our website. And it was immediately clear that the topic could accommodate all sorts of insights across a wide range of disciplines. And that's exactly what our lecture series tries to do. We feature the research of faculty here at Rice and at other local institutions, notably the Medical Center this year. Our aim is to promote discussion, both in a question session that will follow the lecture and then in the reception that follows uh, out in the lobby. And to reinforce a sense of the university as a community joined in a common enterprise of engagement with ideas and the production of knowledge. Failure lies, often unacknowledged, at the heart of our enterprise for the seeds of insight and success may be found in understanding what went wrong, what didn't work as expected, what factors contributed to failure in particular circumstances. Today's lecture, as we shall see, focuses on how failures in visual perception actually help us to understand the successful functioning of human vision and cognition. And we're delighted to have as our speaker today, Jim Pomerantz, professor of psychology here at Rice and director of the neuroscience program. He has held a variety of impressive positions in his academic career, including Dean of Social Sciences here at Rice from 1988 to 1995, provost and acting president of Brown University during the years 1995 to 1998, and last but not least, director of Ciencia from 2000 to 2006. Jim earned his Bachelor of Arts with distinction and high honors in psychology from the University of Michigan and following two years at Bell Telephone Labs, received his PhD from Yale University. He is a cognitive psychologist with a specialty in human visual perception and attention. He's published widely on the perception of form and structure and visual patterns, gestalt psychology, and on the role of attention in perceptual organization. He's also published on motion perception, color perception, texture perception, visual imagery, and theoretical approaches to perception. His most recent edited topics in integrative neuro from cells to cognition was published in 2008 by Cambridge University Press. He is a fellow of the American Psychological Association, the American Psychological Society, and the Society of Experimental Psychologists. He was founding president of FABS, the Foundation for the Advancement of Behavioral and Brain Sciences, a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit, and is president of Disability 101, a Houston-based nonprofit serving individuals with disabling chronic disease. Please join me in welcoming Jim Pomerantz to the podium for his talk on failures of mind and brain. Thank you, Susan, for that kind introduction, and thank all of you for coming out on this uh, rainy day uh, to hear talk on failure. Um, so, ordinarily, it's quite an honor to be asked to be the lead-off speaker in a series, but when the topic is failure, uh, 
it's somewhat ambiguous, but as uh, I think many of the speakers in this series will try to underscore, there is an upside to failure, and I'll try to emphasize that uh, uh, in, in my talk today. So let's get straight to it. Uh, here's an illusion that some of you may have seen called the lilac chaser, and it's one of the ones that I love because it uh, involves multiple illusions that, are, that work simultaneously. That is the basic premise. Uh, a circle of fuzzy disks. Uh, but once we animate them, things start to happen. Now, when this animation comes on, keep your eyes moving uh, across the four corners of this display. Even doing that, you probably notice a few things that seem a little odd. But as you continue uh, to look at the display, things will get odder. Now, put your focus as tightly as you can on the center fixation cross. Now, what you should see is an extraordinary transformation in several respects. First and most obvious is the change in apparent color. I'll explain why that color changes and why it changes from the color that it starts out to the color that it ends up in shortly. And I'll try to make the point that, in fact, all color perception is illusory. This is just a particularly striking example of it. Also changing in the apparent number of dots. It goes from 11 down to 1 when you see that change from the crucial color to the uh, lime green color. And third, you're seeing motion. And as you may know, all motion that's seen on computer screens and projectors is illusory in the first place. So we have at least three illusions going on. There are probably other ones as well. Philosophers in the room might know that all of life is an illusion. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Here's the basic flow that I hope to follow. Talking about the prevalence of failure, following up on what Susan McIntyre said uh, in her opening remarks. Uh, zeroing in on cognition and looking at failures across multiple cognitive systems. Then zooming in still further into perceptual systems and vision in particular, mainly because I study vision, but also it's easier to demonstrate visual illusions than, say, olfactory. I haven't test tested them all. <laughs> That's some striking examples of illusions, starting with illusions in which objects vanish. That seemed to me to be sort of a limiting case of failure in perception, where something that's out there simply ceases to appear before our senses. And then doing as time permits a tour through some of the other uh, illusions involving motion and uh, color and form, and then finally attempting to draw some conclusions. So, there is everywhere. There's a quote from Winston Churchill, or there's some brilliant quotes, <laughs> some of the finest quotes you will encounter anywhere uh, on the topic of failure, which I'm sure means something in itself. Uh, failures range from the true tragedies that strike us uh, whenever they might, down to uh, silly day type of, of errors. Uh, they occur in virtually every facet, oh, let's say in every facet of our lives, both our private lives and our personal lives. Uh, we'll be looking at failure from multiple perspectives during this course. In biology, we've got failures in the body. Which one? Quickly is everybody's favorite to be up on. Uh, some friends of mine who work at Microsoft and their intelligent agent systems said it actually began as a brilliant idea that was destroyed by the marketing people. Uh, in engineering, we have structural uh, uh, failures and computation, we have crashes. In social forms, we have crime, divorce. Literature, fail failures of the heart and of the soul. In businesses, we have failures, bankruptcies, uh, politics, uh, warfare. And in cognition, that I'll move on to next, we have, well, we have so many failures, it's hard to know where to begin. A couple of general remarks on failure. First, any definition of failure has got to include uh, a, a, a notion of intent. It's, it's when you don't achieve an objective that you're trying to achieve. And we can say all of us failed to win the presidency last time there was an election, but none of us were running for presidency, but so is winning on failure. And so you have to know what the system is trying to accomplish, which isn't always uh, self-evident. Failure can occur for physical uh, reasons or for informational reasons. So a computer 
uh, can fail because there's a chip that's bad or because the power supply is broken and the power isn't getting to it. Or it can fail because whoever did programming made a programming error. And third and last, errors can be errors of commission, omission, or distortion. Now, when I talk about making an object disappear, that will obviously be an error of omission, where we fail to see something present. These two slides illustrate errors of commission, where in both cases you see a central square that's not supported by the actual physical stimulus. That is to say, if you want a light meter across this display, there is no square, they're just fragments of circles. And yet, we see a square, in fact, edge detectors in the cortex of the human brain respond as though there were a true edge there, but in fact there's not. Same thing with the colored square we see over here. Now, all three of these um, propositions on this slide will be important as we see how failure plays out in the perceptual system. So on to uh, failures in cognition. Great quote from Mary Pickford. I'll leave that long enough for you to read it, which should be about now. Let's begin with the human brain. The uh, human brain is often described as the most complex structure in the known universe. There are 100 billion plus working cells or neurons, not to mention any support cells. Uh, and each of those neurons has up to 1,000 inputs and 1,000 outputs. So just try to visualize the number of discrete states the brain can assume given those numbers. It defies comprehension. And so how many possible points of failure are there for the brain? Unimaginably large number. Within the brain, these cells that do all the work are called neurons. They themselves can fail. They release uh, chemicals uh, at the junction between one synapse and another. Those chemicals can fail or be blocked by the presence of other chemicals. Most neurodegenerative diseases operate somewhere at this level uh, and produce symptoms that, uh, that we're all unfortunately familiar with. Here's a schematic diagram of the brain of a primate. This is, despite its bewildering complexity, a greatly oversimplified cartoon. But I should point out that every one of the lines in this cartoon is supported by experimental evidence. It's not that an artist has gone nuts uh, drawing boxes and connecting them uh, really nearly. So failures in cognition. Oh. That's a failure, but is it? Uh, I think uh, this one is the failure. <laughs> or this one. <laughs> An example of a memory failure, and one that I selected before I knew we were actually going to be facing a language today. But if you're not seeing it well, these are two dinosaurs that apparently didn't read the memo very well and didn't know it was Noah's Ark though. So that's memory up at the top. We're all, we're all familiar with retrieval lapses. Uh, some of us are familiar with uh, deterioration that occurs in storage. Usually when we're blocking on an item in our memory, it's in there. We're just experiencing a retrieval failure. Often we know that because the information we claim to get out of our memory comes out at a later date. In attention, we have inattentional blindness, all the discussions about whether we should have laws preventing us from using cell phones while we're driving cars have to do with the deleterious effect of uh, tending to a telephone conversation on our driving. Learning, of course, we all know about learning disorders, but we should keep in mind that failure is essential to learning. We learn often in life through trial and error, and unless you commit those errors, you don't get a full, a full range of feedback that's necessary for learning. And we've got failures of language, decision-making, thinking, human performance, general cognition, errors that induce uh, by fatigue, and then finally, what I'll be talking about today, errors of perception. And so, visual illusions and what they mean, failure changes for the better, success for the worse. Interesting mm -hmm. hypothesis uh, when you think about it. So we've seen the picture of the brain. Here's a slice of the interior of the brain, an axial cut that shows you at least a portion of the visual system. A lot of the brain has to do with vision. Uh, sometimes we think vision, we take it for granted. We open our eyes, we look around, we see the world. So that's pretty easy. It seems easy until we try to build artificial devices like one of these. The same job. So here basically are the two eyes, the optic nerves leading from the eyes into the uh, thalamus and the lateral geniculate nucleate and finally onto the cortex where the, uh, 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 the work of converting uh, uh, optics into conscious experiences uh, uh, begins. 
And so here's a flattened piece of brain tissue that's colored uh, to indicate where the areas of the brain are. This is a primate man, not a human brain. Uh, well, humans are primates, but it's not, it's not human. Uh, but showing where uh, some of the critical areas for visual processing are concerned. And here's another cartoon lighting diagram just for the portion of the brain having to do with vision. Before jumping on the failures of vision, let's not forget that there are successes. So successes abound. If we look around the room, say, well, what is it we're missing? Is there anything in this room that our eyes are failing to deliver to us? Well, it's hard to know what you're missing because you're missing it. And how do you know if you're missing it? But um, nothing really obvious. It seems like we see all the objects. We see all the colors. We see all the motion. We see things in proper depth. We could probably if we had artistic talents, do the painting, or the accurately depicts what's in the world. Well, it seems that our vision is pretty good. Uh, we've got decent acuity, good enough to be able to read this slide, at least most of us, so we require power help uh, in the form of glasses. We've got pretty good color vision, uh, not as good as a pigeon. We've got, as I mentioned, uh, shortly three cones, uh, short, medium, long, and sensitive cones. Uh, pigeons have five, there's some short that have ten. They probably see colors much better than we do, but we do all right. Um, we've got decent depth perception, motion perception, but most importantly, we pass the test of evolution. If our vision, sense of vision, with which most of us feel in the course of contact with the surrounding world, were not serving us well, we wouldn't be here. So let's not go overboard on what I'll be talking about on the failures, but to remember the successes. So, what about failures in vision? Well, we can divide them at first cut into two broad classes. First failures that are based on rare biology and anatomy, namely damage to the eyes, damage to the brain, basically damage to the hardware or the wet mode that supports more function. And so we've got blindnesses, deformments, and oh, the result of illness, injury, or disease. So this is an example of premature. You can see both the left and the right eye in this person. Uh, they've lost vision in the central uh, area. It's like macular regeneration. Uh, strokes, well, you don't need to have gone to medical school to see that there's something horribly wrong with these brains. Uh, Alzheimer's, uh, again, if you're familiar with all the normal brains, you will see that the, that the fissures or the sort of folds between uh, uh, areas of the brain uh, uh, are much wider and larger than they ought to be. The ventricles are much wider. Essentially, it's like somebody has sucked a knife out of this brain and left a very small remnant of what used to be there originally. And here are tumors, and again, you don't have to go to medical school to stop that. And you can see the effect that it's having on um, the rest of the hemi hemisphere of the brain, in fact, it's going to run into the lateral hemisphere. So we have various forms of blindness. Uh, most of us, when we think of blindness, think first of total blindness, uh, which can occur for a variety of reasons. There's a cross-section of the optic nerve. And you see these nerves are coated with a uh, white fatty substance that's an insulator. It's called myelin. That speeds up their transmission, so the picture from the eye gets to the brain in a hurry. And also limits crosstalk or short circuiting between neurons. The body sometimes falsely identifies this myelin as a foreign substance and a toxic. That's what we call multiple sclerosis. And one of the first signs of multiple sclerosis is rare vision. Rare vision. Uh, we also have rare vision, partial blindnesses, tunnel vision. But aside from that kind of general overall blindness, we have a whole bunch of very specific blindnesses. Color blindness. Now, when most people think of color blindness, they think of somebody who sees the world in shades of black and white. But most forms of color blindness are just partial. In fact, there are dozens of different kinds of color blindness, and I'll explain how the occurring in failure arises if something unusual happens at different points. Uh, there are people who are motion blind. Um, see my moving hand, not as a continuously moving hand, but as a series of stills. And it's not like they don't know what motion is. Many of them used to be able to see motion just fine. When something happened, and were incident, and now they've lost the ability to see motion. There are people who are stereo blind, who are unable to solve the magic eye puzzles in the Sunday funny papers. Um, most people can't do that, suffer from a different disorder called impatience. Um, <laughs> simply don't stay out of that enough, but there are some people who are truly stereo blind. 
And we can see the world of depth for other reasons. Uh, we can all see depth on the flat television set, uh, but they're missing stellar options. Uh, and finally, a lot has been made in the last in recent years about face blindness or so-called present prognosia. Uh, if you have present prognosia, you still see people and see their faces. You just you know that you're looking at a face, but you can't identify its features or recognize the face, even if it's your own face or your mother's face, uh, even though you can still uh, pass a smelling eye-sharp test or uh, a driver's license test. So we've got all kinds of optical problems. Um, we've got myopia, probably more than half of you in the room have this one. Presbyopia, which occurs with wisdom, I mean, where we have the whole newspapers around for astigmatism, which changes as you look at your head, strabismus having to do with alignment of the eyes, uh, cataracts having to do with clouding in the cornea or the lens. These are all familiar problems, um, most of them are easily uh, treated. But the other class uh, of problem, um, the theory and the one I'll be talking about today, has to do with uh, misperceptions that occur with perfectly normal, healthy individuals whose visual system is working just fine. Failures that occur despite a healthy organism, uh, misperceptions attributable to system design, learning, or temporary states, like the illusions that we talked about, inability to discriminate and hallucinations. And just to give you a preview, this is the so-called cafe wall illusion, uh, named after uh, tiled walls in a cafeteria in England. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing about that is that all the horizontal lines are perfectly horizontal and perfectly parallel, and what we see them is in Kenny records. Why? Well, it turns out they're part of a larger class of illusion. I love this illusion because people can look at it forever, my guess is for their entire lifetime, and never realize they were seeing something illusory. The illusion in this figure is that there are no spirals in this figure, they're only concentric circles. You'll have to print this out uh, to verify it yourself if you don't believe me just because I said it. Um, but you might be able to verify these more easily. These uh, don't exactly look like two concentric rings. They look like they're in a lot but they're perfectly concentric. These are perfect circles. Here's the cafe wall again and a very of it. Uh, by bringing in another circle, you might be able to see, hmm, it does match up pretty well. If you look at the width of this gray gap in here, you can see that it's pretty much constant in area. So you've got this interesting schism between what our vision is telling us in one way from what it's telling us in another way. And so by the same token here. It turns out these problems have to do with how our visual system computes local orientation. There are cells in the brain discovered by uh, a scientist Hubert and Weasel who won the Nobel Prize for their work showing the, the um, existence of cells in the uh, various parts of the visual system with a lot of geniculate and the cortex that are responsible, that are responsible to very, very local properties, properties that are being tweaked by these displays to produce a misperception uh, in, our, uh, uh, in our ultimate conscious perception. So, what do these illusions mean? Well, they can indicate surely a damaged area of neural tissue, but more often they represent a system that normally does just fine, thank you, but that can be tricked up in the lab. Often they tap into a decision that's been made through evolution about how to resolve a trade-off. There are all kinds of trade-offs that the brain faces. The brain has 100 billion neurons, but it turns out you can do better with 200 billion. If you want to carry around a head that had a brain and it decides that they're going to build up, we have to uh, do all we can with what we got, and often that involves making decisions of sliding along the trade-off curve. And that what happens is that researchers like me show what's going on with that trade-off by pushing to one end or the other and making the system look stupid. When in fact the system is quite smart, you might very well have made that same trade-off decision yourself. I'll explain more about that later on, but often that's the, the case. So, on to examples. How to make an object vanish. That, you would think, is the ultimate failure in vision where you just don't see an object at all. So here's a baker, baker's dozen ways to make uh, uh, objects vanish. First one, remove the object from view. So it's really only 12 for you. Okay. All the other 12 involve leaving the object there. It vanishes for reasons that have to do with neural structures and uh, 
of the software uh, of the brain, if you will. So, bringing the image in another part of the spectrum, or size scale, or speed scale. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, when I ask, do, are any of us missing anything when we look around the room that we're sitting in now? The answer I would give you is yes, you're missing almost everything. Almost everything that's in this room right now you're failing to see. So let's begin with the spectrum. Uh, we're all taught about the spectrum, uh, radio spectrum, TV spectrum, microwaves, infrared. This little portion in here that's exaggerated this strong. Ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays, cosmic rays. Basically, they're all just variations uh, in wavelength along the electromagnetic scale. And there's nothing colored about any of them. If you think that the light that we perceive is actually colored, or even Newton knew that it's not, then we must be able to say what the color is of cosmic rays or radio waves. What color is KUHF? Not so true. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> We are responsive. Our eyes are responsive to the narrowest sliver along the electromagnetic spectrum. Almost everything else we're blind to. Every cell phone conversation in Houston right now is passing through all of our bodies undetected. Every AM, FM radio station, TV station, it's all flying right through us and we're on the rise. So when I say, are we missing anything? Yeah, we're missing almost everything. Here's an example of two flowers, uh, pictures taken of them in the ultraviolet sensitive film and film that mimics the human eye. Notice there's a spot on the flower when we look at it through ultraviolet light, but not through regular light. So if you're looking at this flower and there's an insect sitting on your shoulder looking at the flower, you're going to see very different pictures. So who's right? For black-eyed surgeons, where there's a pattern that just becomes much larger under ultraviolet light. You know, for infrared, when you see thermal photographs, well, some animals see uh, heat. Snakes, for example, see heat. Uh, and so we may have uh, military that have little goggles uh, on that give us uh, thermal photographs, but our eye, that's because our eyes don't furnish that information for us. Size scale. This creature is called the dust bite, and they're all over all of us right now. The number of mites in the human body is staggering. If you take your own pillowcase and put it under a microscope tonight, you would be appalled by what you see. <laughs> when you look at a human being, if you think it's a human being, it's actually a colony. You're the only, the person you're looking at is the only person there, but there are tons of other entities there. And not only is that person outnumbered the American, obviously, that person's outnumbered by cell count. Most of the cells in the so-called human body belong to other organisms, like mites, bacteria, microorganisms. And yet we miss it. I guess it's a blessing if you want to look at all that, but that's the way it is. Now you said that we're actually inhaling these things. Speed. We see events that unfold only within a very narrow range of speed. So these are the famous heroines who can photograph of, uh, this is a bullet looking for an apple. Uh, he's famous also for the one of uh, uh, Melbourne being dropped into a bowl of milk and producing a beautiful corona. These events occur too rapidly for us to be able to see. So you might say, well, shouldn't evolution have equipped us to be able to see a speeding bullet? Well, you might wonder whether there ever were objects moving as quickly as a bullet during the period of human evolution. Probably not. Well, anyway, if there were, if a bully was coming at you, what are you going to do about it? Well, it wouldn't help much anyway because our motor system isn't equipped to respond. But the same can be said for the motion of the tectonic plates, for even the motion of an hour hand on a clock. Those motions are just as real as the motions we're familiar with, but we tend to think that what we see is real and everything else. Well, it's not real motion. Uh, uh, that's more the way we describe the world than the way the world is. Okay, so that's how you can make something invisible. You know, paint it with ultraviolet sensitive paint or make it too small or make it too fast. Here are a couple more ways. Put the image into the eye's blind spots or stabilize the image on the retina. Now, let's take those in order. 
There is a picture of the interior of the eye. You can't see the retina, the actual nerve cells, but you can see the blood supply. You can see here in the phobia, that's the area of sharpest vision. So when you want to look at something, you move your head, you rotate your eyeball so the image falls right in the phobia. Over here is the point where the optic nerve exits the eye and heads toward the brain. It's just too crowded and too busy there to have space for any rods and cones. So you have no light sensors in that patch of your eye. So when you look around the world, there's actually a blind spot in each of your eyes. Why don't you see that blind spot? Well, you could say that cleverly, the blind spots have been located in different regions of space in the two eyes. So the left eye fills in for the right eye's blind spot and the right eye's for the left. You can show that's false, however, by simply covering one eye and see if you can see the blind spot in your uh, single eye. You still can. The answer has to do with a filling in process that I'll say more about. But basically, well, in a nutshell, the brain makes stuff up. Uh, it turns out we're making a huge amount up, and I'll show you some demonstrations of that specifically on color in just a bit. So in any case, that, that's how you can make an object disappear. There are some people who have very large blind spots that are the result of disease or accident. And these folks have scotomas, sometimes cover half of their visual field. Interestingly enough, they're not aware of it. And if they're told by the ophthalmologist that they have a large blind spot, they get into an argument with the ophthalmologist about it, a condition known as neglect. So the, so the filling in process deals not just with a little bitty hole uh, that we have in our, uh, sorry, in our uh, field of vision, but in areas that are as large as 20 30 degrees of visual angle uh, for the moment. So that's number one. Oh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, number, uh, excuse me, number three. Uh, number four, uh, stabilize the object's image on the retina. You may know that your eyes are constantly moving, not just in these large saccadic eye movements that we engage in when we read, or in smooth pursuit movements when we watch a bird fly across the sky, but the eye is constantly a quiver. Uh, just like uh, you can try to hold the laser pointer absolutely still, I can get reasonably still. Um, uh, at this distance, but the eyes are always jittery. Uh, that might seem like a design failure, but the effect of that jitter is that it keeps the image moving over the retina. When the image is frozen on the retina, you go blind. Absolutely, completely, and totally blind in under a second, and nothing will reappear until either the eye moves or the brain moves. Now, probably you've not consciously experienced this effect for yourself, but you have experienced it. You're experiencing it right now. Go back to this slide. We have an odd design feature within our eye where the blood vessels that feed the eye, and yes, the eye's got to eat its oxygen and glucose. Um, but the blood vessels are actually in the right path. You gotta wonder. Maybe Clippy helped design the eye. Um, the vet was also installed backwards with the rods and cones facing the dark back of the eye instead of coming out toward the light. There's all kinds of problems. But so the question arises is why don't you see your blood vessels when you look out in the world? They're right there casting shadows on your retina. The truth of the matter is that you do see them occasionally when your ophthalmologist is examining your eye with an ophthalmoscope. I, I won't try it with his laser pointer. A very bright light that shine in your eyes. And what happens is that you see this kind of red, red light pattern light up, and you're seeing momentarily the shadows of your own blood vessels. They then disappear like every other image disappears because they're not moving over the eye. So if you are able to hold your eyes very, very, very still, you'll see that you can make uh, stimuli disappear. In fact, you've already seen an example of that, and I'll show you it again in a second. Mayer discovered canals on the moon. This is one of his drawings of canals on the moon. It's been speculated that what he was actually seeing was the bright pattern that flashed in when he put his eye up against the uh, piece of the uh, microscope. This is the front page of the New York Times, by the way, proclaiming canals on the moon. Just in case you think that anything you read in the Tuesday science time is necessary. Remember that this lilac chaser that we all looked at? Uh, a while ago, but if you stare at this um, spot, then the number of spots you see uh, drops down to just one. It's another example of the disappearance of a stabilized image. If you keep your eyes moving, 
we notice that that won't happen. You continue to see the fuchsia color, and you continue to see 11 spots. But if you hold your eyes really still, you will see just one spot, and it will be in the antagonistic or opposite uh, color to, to the original one. Okay? If you're not seeing this effect, it probably means you're not holding your eyes still enough. So you have to switch to decaf or find some other way to stabilize your eye movements. Numbers five and six. Make the images, object's image, part of the background or use color texture camouflage. All of us have seen the FedEx logo on a practically a daily basis on this campus, but most people fail to see the hidden figure in it, one for which FedEx paid dearly. It's perfectly visible and it's an arrow. But even told that it's an arrow, many people fail to see it sometimes for minutes without seeing it. It's right there. The reason that you don't see it is that it's perceived as part of the background. Whenever the visual system encounters an edge, like this edge or this edge, it has to determine if it's a depth edge. It turns out there's six different types of edges that occur in visual uh, images. And one of them is a depth image where one surface or object is in front of another, like my hand in front of my shirt. And if you determine it is a depth edge, you have to figure out which is the near side and which is the far side. And if you get it wrong, concave becomes convex and convex becomes concave. And so your structural description of this image will usually not include the description of the arrow because it's simply the shapeless background that happens accidentally to the appearing through. There's color or texture camouflage. There's some great examples uh, of this. Uh, here's one here, but let me see if I can uh, persuade this one to uh, come up. Uh, I didn't try this out before, so we will see if it's going to work. These are from the fabulous TED lectures, for those of you who uh, are TED fans. Hello, water. There's a good reason why. I mean, the shallow water is full of predators. Here's a barracuda. And if you're an octopus or a cephalopod, you need to really understand how to use your surroundings to hide. In the next scene, you're going to see a nice coral bottom, and you see that an octopus would stand out very easily there if you couldn't use your camouflage, use your skin to change color and texture. Here's some algae in the foreground, and an octopus. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Now, Roger spooked him, so it's, he took off, a cloud of ink, lands, and when he lands, the octopus says, look, I've been seen, best thing to do is get as big as I can get. That big brown makes his eye spot very big. So he's bluffing. Let's do it backwards. I thought he was joking when he first showed it to me. I thought it was all graphics. So here, here it is in reverse. Watch the skin color. Watch the skin texture. Just an amazing animal. Can change color and texture to match the surroundings. Watch him blend right into this algae. One, two, three. <laughs> So um, you can make an object appear to disappear, if I can say that, <laughs> by uh, surrounding it with the right kind of contacts, either so it becomes background or so that it blends into the, into the background. Continuing on these 12 ways to make an object that's actually going to disappear. Have the object appear just before a blink, or have the object appear just before an eye movement? Let's think about blinking for a moment. When you blink, the lights go out in your environment. A piece of tissue comes down over your eye. This happens to most of us uh, once every five seconds. And you'd think, you know, if the lights went off in this room every five seconds, you'd all be looking around and saying, what's going on? But when we blink, we don't. It's because there's circuitry that blinds us during a blink, so we're not attending to it. It does not take its wet. And there's a continuity, a filling process that allows us to maintain the continuity of the world around us. The interesting thing is that we go blind not only during the blink, but slightly beforehand. We know this thing, like experiments where we shine light in the eye during a blink, and you might say, well, how do you do that? You've got an eyelid that's messing up. We can shine light in the eye by going up to the palate. And so you shine a very, very bright light through. And you find out how much light it takes for people to be able to detect it. And you discover that the threshold goes way, way up. You become worse at detecting light a uh, few fractions of a second before the blink actually begins. Same thing with the eye movements. 
if you watch a movie where the person who's held the camcorder is moving around like so, it very quickly makes you sick. So you've got circuitry that compensates for movements uh, of the eye, our own camera, but that also blinds us during movements. We don't see the kind of swirling that we would see if we took a camera and, and left the camera running while we moved it around. And again, that blindness begins before the actual eye movement. So it's a circuit there whose intention is to keep you from, uh, from uh, uh, paying attention to, uh, to the eye movement or the blink. Surround the object with a moving grid. Let's see if this one will work. This is an example of a fairly recently discovered uh, effect where um, uh, we can take a What we've got here is sort of a flashing point we're supposed to be paying attention to, and then three uh, running uh, spots out of the corner. And when we start this blue pattern rotating, just stare, stare as best you can at this center dot, and you'll notice that uh, uh, blue pattern, uh, excuse me, that you'll notice the yellow dots disappear. Now, if we stop this pattern, you won't get disappearance unless you really are good at stabilizing the line movement. There's an optimal speed. But all of these are examples of uh, uh, basically alternative ways of uh, getting the same effect to, uh, to occur. Follow the object's appearance with a flash or a ring. Uh, this is William Wright over from the University of Houston across town, uh, who studies a very interesting type of masking called meta-contrast masking. And it's hard to demonstrate outside the lab, so I'll have to simply describe it to you. But you're looking at a screen, like a TV screen, and a bright disk is flashed on the screen for a fraction of a second. Then there's a pause, and there's a ring surrounding just where the disk had been. So think of it as donut hole, pause, donut. If you get the timing just right, you don't see the donut hole. If the donut follows the donut hole too quickly, you'll see it. If it's too slowly, you'll see it. But if it comes in just right, about 50 or 60 milliseconds behind the offset of the donut, you fail to see it. Well, that tells you a whole bunch of things. One very interesting thing it tells you is that you don't see the world in real time. If you've seen the real world as it occurs, there's no way something later can keep you from seeing something earlier because you've already seen it. So when we see the world, we see it all right. But this shows that the circuitry is set up so that a later event can come in and overtake an earlier event and keep you from seeing something that's already occurred. That's what's going on. We can get similar effects with flashes of light. If some uh, thoughtless photographer comes up and blasts you in the face with a bright electronic flash, you walk around blinded for a while. That then it's master of that sort as well. But this is a different, uh, a different, very interesting type. Direct attention away from the object. This is how magicians do their work. They basically say, look over here. They're not quite that. They're more subtle than that, but they're going to need to divert your attention. Um, we have a limited ability to uh, attend to multiple objects at a time. Ordinarily, eye movements are the instrument of selection, but if we set up an image so that we cannot use eye movements to decide what to attend to, we end up with an image like this. I snagged this off of the Rice University campaign video, some of you may recognize. John Bowles, professor of history at Rice. His face is superimposed upon the face of Edgar Adela. Ah, what a selective attention is weird. These colors didn't all come through very well, but here's a other way of looking at selective attention. Sometimes we can't fail to attend to a stimulant that we attempt not to. So here your job is to look at the color on which these words are printed, and this one that says yellow, and you're supposed to say yellow, but it's saying, it's spelling out the word green. This is the famous stoop effect that uh, virtually all of us fail at, so miserably we usually start laughing at ourselves in the middle of the test. Um, some of you may be familiar with a phenomenon called change blindness from Daniel Simons. Uh, let me give you um, an example of, uh, uh, of change blindness. Now here, we will turn on a picture that is going to, well, your job is just, just look at the picture and see if anything changes as you watch it.
Most people fail to notice that anything has changed. Um, if you're quite sharp, you will have noticed. Most people fail to spot that. Here's an experiment that was done. Uh, it's got kind of a long lead in. Uh, done by, uh, by Dan Simon's. Uh, Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? I think this is probably not going to work because probably too many of you have heard about it. But uh, the basic idea is that your job is to count how many times as you just said the ball is passed between or among the right shirted players. And if you're paying close attention, you'll fail to notice the gorilla who's just walked out <laughs> into the middle of this. Uh, so this, this uh, movie is called Gorillas in Our Midst. Um, and uh, I should say, by way of full disclosure, that Dan Simons is my cousin, but uh, he now has a book out uh, uh, that uh, deals with uh, the, the phenomenon of change blindness. Now, in general, the human visual system is highly sensitive to change, but uh, what Simons has done is shown us some examples of the limitations on our ability to notice when the world has changed around us. Number 12, disrupt the visual cortex with magnetic stimulation. Uh, this is a picture taken right here in City Hall at Rice University of a, uh, probably a graduate student, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, being um, tested with transcranial magnetic stimulation where a powerful, uh, rapidly oscillating magnetic field is placed, placed directly over the uh, scalp. Uh, generally, these are done not with repetitive, but just single shot oscillations. Uh, but nonetheless, if I were talking to you and someone were to come along and give me one of those single shots right over my left ear, I would be unable to speak for several seconds until uh, my scrambled neurons were able to get their act back together again and let me uh, continue. So that would be another way to get an object to disappear, is to run the TMS over the V1 uh, uh, or the stride cortex at the very back of the occipital lobe of the brain. And last, but not least, have the perceiver engage in visual imagery. Now, let's suppose that your job is to detect a very uh, faint flash of light, like a brief flicker of this laser pointer. Oh, it's so bright, you probably wouldn't miss it in any case, in any circumstance. But while you're performing this difficult visual task, you're asked to either hear music in your mind's ear or watch movies in your mind's eye. And both of those simultaneous concurrent tasks cause a decrement in performance. We're better at perform we're worse at performing any cognitive task when we're trying to do a second task concurrently. But if you're trying to do a visual imagery task, like count the number of windows in the house that you grew up in by taking a visual tour walking through that house, your ability to perceive an actual stimulus declines. And in fact, sometimes you confuse what you're imagining with what you're uh, actually seeing. So these are a bunch of ways in which we can make an object disappear. Let me in my remaining time just go through uh, a few more examples of, uh, of, uh, of illusions that perhaps are slightly less dramatic. And first of all, I should clarify that we often hear these illusions referred to as optical, but rarely are they optical. None of the ones I've shown you today are optical. Here's an optical illusion. There's a pencil sticking in a glass of water. The pencil appears bent. 
And it appears bent because water and air have different refractive indices, so that the light is actually bent kind of running out. Now, if you take that same pencil, tie it off, and then put it into motion like so, that pencil appears to become rubbery. That's not an optical illusion. Optics have nothing to do with it. What has everything to do with this illusion is the sluggishness of your visual system. Our visual systems are so slow, you can't see the flickering that's taking place on the screen. If I stand back here and look at the projector light, not exactly a pleasant thing to do, and move my eyes back and forth, I can see the flickering. I can actually separate out the red from the green from the blue guns that are producing these colored images. Um, and so that term optical illusion uh, is, is almost always uh, misapplied uh, when we look at these kinds of effects we've been seeing today. Uh, so let's, uh, let's look at color for a few minutes. Uh, color is mixed uh, in different ways. Most of us know in our rules of color mixture, unfortunately, for our mixing paints. That's a subtractive kind of mixture because paints eat light. Uh, instead, we need to look at them from the point of view of uh, adding lights as this projector does. When we look at an area of the screen that's white, the projector is not capable of producing the ordinary spectrum we associate with light, namely a fairly flat spectrum from 400 to 700 nanometers. Instead, it produces a spike from a long wave length range going out towards uh, 650 so um, uh, nanometers, uh, a medium one green and a short wave length one blue, and when they're combined in the right ways, uh, we see uh, the, uh, the, the full spectrum of colors. When you look at a bright yellow stimulus, like a golden arches for a McDonald's ad, or bright yellow Kodak box, you say, well, how do we get that yellow on the screen? That yellow on the screen is produced by turning the red gun all the way up, the green gun all the way up, and the blue gun all the way down. That is yellow. And if that's not an illusion, I don't know what is. We are making that up. As I said earlier, there's nothing colorful about wavelengths anyway, if they were, then gamma rays and micro rays were in colors as well. So when we see an image like this, we can really think of it as being three different images, and if you composite these three, that's exactly what you end up with. Um, we've all seen images of the American flag. This is a kind of a loopy illusion where you hold your fixation as long as you can on that cross, then, fix, then switch to a black side, and you're supposed to see a normally colored um, American flag. But let me give you, a, if you want to show colored after images, let me give you a stronger version. Stare as hard as you can at the top uh, of the blue uh, triangle. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Now those are colored after images. Now, if we went instead to just a blank screen after these, you wouldn't see uh, color after images anywhere near as persuasive as these, because color tends to flood out until it hits a boundary. Basically, the visual system colors our world by sampling around the border and then filling in the rest of our field of view with that color until it hits another edge. And so it's a little like paint programs you've already played with on your computer where you can flood an area and the paint just flows. That's how we see color. Most of it we're making up. So you'd be looking at an area of space and saying that's green, when in fact it's totally red. We're making it up. We're using a rule that serves us well. How often during evolution did we stabilize images on our retina? Never. It never happened until laboratory equipment came along that made it possible to do just that. Well, that's not exactly true. The South American Indians uh, discovered the drug curare and that it's a paralyzing effect on muscles. And if you inject curare into your eye muscles, your eyes become unable to move. And so you do. This, this is not an experiment that most of my students like to volunteer for. <laughs> uh, but it's a powerful way of demonstrating the disappearance of stabilized energy. <coughs> you may have seen this. Uh, a fact where you take a reverse contrast photograph, you stare at that red spot, five, four, three, two, one, and then you see a colored after image, when in fact this image is completely monochromatic. You may need to try that one at home, you can Google it. This comes off of Akiyoshi's website, and I'll include a link to that. Uh, there's an effect that takes too long to demonstrate, but it's Celeste McCulloch's uh, 1965 paper that made the cover of science. It is for me, the most extraordinary visual effect I've ever seen. It takes 10 minutes in a nice dark room to demonstrate well. But essentially what you do is you spend 10 minutes looking at this slide, alternating with that slide. 
And it's, you got to have a cup of coffee or something to get to uh, listen to some music. You can be doing anything with your eyes as long as you keep them fixated near the center. You then turn to a test pattern, and what you'll see here is that the areas that are horizontal will now be reddish, and the areas that are vertical will now be greenish. In other words, the colors, I have it right, are going to reverse. And as you're seeing those illusory colors, if you tilt your head 45 degrees, they vanish. You tilt them another 45 degrees to your head sideways, they reappear with the opposite pairing. This effect lasts for not just minutes or hours, but days, and in some cases, weeks. <laughs> That's an impressive effect that tells us something about it. Basically, how the human visual system achieves white balance. If you know about your camera, whether it's a video camera or a regular uh, snow camera, it doesn't know what color light it's looking at. If you point a camera at a red wall, the camera has no way of knowing whether it's looking at a red wall that's illuminated with white light, or it's looking at a white wall illuminated with red light. So it asks you. It asks you by having you turn the dial on your camera and say you're in sun, you're in fluorescent light, because it can't tell. Humans can tell. We're very good at figuring out the color of the illuminant, the source of illumination, and factoring that into our color. Judgments. And that's why we can put on a pair of green sunglasses and look at somebody with a white shirt and tell that the shirt is white, even though we now know the light in our eyes is green, tinted by the sunglasses. Um, we know quite a bit about how color vision works because there are people out there who are colorblind. There's a simple circuit that shows how color vision works in, the, in human vision. It's a very, very weird system that has three different distinct levels of representation. The first has to do with this long, medium, and short wave sensitive cone. Most of us in this room have three cone types, sometimes called, and you have to cringe when you hear this red, green, and blue. They're just long, medium, and short wavelength sensitive cones. But if you wire them together in different ways, like here's an example of your painting together or summing the red and green and subtracting the blue, that basically ends up giving you a yellow versus blue channel. In other words, it's a channel that just tells you where your uh, where the object you're looking at is along the yellow blue continuum. Uh, here is the red green channel, and here's the achromatic channel. It's just they're simple, uh, very, very simple neural circuits that will give you those kinds of colors. Red and green are opposite of one another. That's why we don't see objects that are reddish green. Saying something is reddish green is saying it's like it's biggish little or polished short. It can't be. By the same token, something can't be yellowish blue. They're opposites. If you remember going back to this slide, here, let's take a look at the blue. Five, four, three, two, one. And notice the color of the after it. It's yellow. Let's go to this red. Again, it's best if you fixate at that point. I just find the tip of the little triangle to work well. Five, four, three, two, one, look at the red. It goes to green. There's another image that made the circuit a couple of years ago of a rotating ballerina. ballerina. The question is which way she rotated, viewed from above, clockwise or counterclockwise. But the silhouette gives you no clue as to what the right answer is. In short, there is no right answer. But when you look at it, the brain has made up an answer. You will see an answer. And if you have patience and wait long enough, she will reverse in her rotation. But it's one of those things like the flipping of an Ecker cube. You can't force it, nor can you prevent it once that first flip occurs. You're already seeing this. Oh, I just did want to say that uh, what color is the single disc when you're down to seeing just one? It's green. That would be the opposite uh, for humans of the fusion. And by the way, this is just for humans. If you're a pigeon, well, if a pigeon were in here looking at us, watching the screens, that pigeon would be laughing at us in pity. Because as I mentioned earlier, pigeons have five different colors. Pigeons almost certainly see different primary colors than we do. You know, we normally talk about red, green, yellow, and blue as being the four primaries. Imagine that we all woke up tomorrow and we all could see a new primary as unique as red, green, yellow, or blue that we've never seen before. For me, it would be like waking up tomorrow and hearing that mathematicians have discovered a new integer between 7 and 8 that had previously been overlooked. <laughs> it would be stunning. But in the case of pigeons, it's probably true. 
And in the case of shrimp, who have up to 10, I think you have one shrimp with 11 percent that they almost certainly see uh, colors that, that we don't. So um, closing out on color, I did want to say something about black versus white. Uh, this is the now famous simulating grid. If you're seeing changes from black to white, uh, that's what this illusion is about. In a sense, a failure to get black and white right, right is kind of the limiting case of a failure in vision. The simplest thing a visual system can do is see white. And if there's a lot of it, we call it white. And if there's none of it, we call it black. If you get black versus white wrong, where does that lead you? Well, we're getting it wrong here. Uh, this is a variant of the famous Hermit grid that any of you can draw. You see gray spots at the intersections. Most people assume that's the illusion. Well, if you think about it, it could be that the illusion is not seeing the gray spots, it's watching them vanish when you look at them. It's a little like trying to examine a shadow with a flashlight. You destroy the very thing you're trying to get. And so here's the variation off of this. Again, some of these work better at different size scales, so if you're not getting it in the back of the room, it might work better in front. I'm getting it great over here and not getting it so well here. Here's a picture of a checkerboard illuminated from the upper right with a cone, or a cylinder rather, casting a shadow. What's going on in this display, uh, I won't have time to uh, prove it to you, is that, of course, both the light and the dark squares get darker in the shadow. But the surprising fact is that the light square in the shadow, B, has exactly the same luminance as the dark square outside the shadow. You can verify that with a light meter if you'd like to. It's surprising, but it's true. We see this surface is dark gray, and this one is a light or gray or white. If you take your finger and hold it up all your eyes so you block out the transition, we'll see that they're identical. This is a famous Orange Street O'Brien edge and shows that just as the individual system calculates color at edges, it also calculates luminance or brightness. Uh, here's a famous effect where you take a bar of constant luminance and you put it on a gradient background. Again, if you can block your fingers out, uh, block out the image of your fingers, you can verify that the the intensity of the stimulus is the same going all the way across its width. Now, you're probably all familiar with uh, how a ribbon gray will look lighter on a uh, dark background and a darker on a light background. But let's just take a notice of the objects in this room and say, well, what color, what, Sydney, how do we get the colors in this room? Yeah, it's strange. What, 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 color? So what color would you call this? Terry <laughs> Do you feel like you're having any trouble answering these questions? <laughs> Who comes to the ceiling? Who comes to the screen? Well, I heard some black and some white. We normally call it white. You just walked into this room and the projector were off. Let's see what this one is. But if we put something on it, some text, now all of a sudden this is white, this becomes black. We can't decide whether something is white or black just by looking at it out of context. Black versus white for a human visual system is a relational color. If something is next to something else that's much more intense, say too long and it's more intense than it is, the lighter thing is white, the darker thing is black, end of story. So if you think the camera is dumb for not being able to tell black from white, either can we if we don't have the appropriate context. So there are lots of other effects. I wish we had more time to run through them all. I would be happy to if we had time, but we don't. So let me conclude. Uh, uh, this is an effect where these two faces look the same, but when you turn them in. Uh, and I'm trying to think of uh, Barack Obama, but uh, I was picking on some uh, Republicans earlier. But this effect is actually called the Margaret Thatcher movie. <laughs> there are academics who are not too happy with her at that age. Um, and yet, here's an effect attributed to Roger Shepard. These two yellow box stops seem to be very different in shape. They are identical. So, let me conclude. Uh, we learn much from failure. The failures of the human visual system are sometimes debilitating. We become blind, we become unable to function. But most of the failures that we see of uh, the sort that we're showing you with these illusions demonstrate decisions that have been made 
during the process of evolution about what's the best way to get information that's useful. It's true that we'd do a lot better if we had four cones rather than three. Five would be even better. But we, do we really want the neural wiring? It's complicated enough dealing with all the fibers coming in from the long, short, short medium wavelength sensitive tones. And so we've decided to capitalize on the redundancy that exists in our world. We can see the world pretty well in that narrow sliver of radiation that we call light. We might do a little better if we could see infrared or ultraviolet like other creatures can, but we do well enough. And so from these failures, we learn how the system is designed. And by looking at the particular design failure, we see how the system is built. Uh, we can like, we do like what Aristotle said, that to look at the, uh, we can, how we can carve nature at its joints, that its natural breakpoints or failure points. And that's basically how it works. So a great example, uh, my, my favorite is this. The failures of color vision come in the form of colored minuses, colored after images, and colored mixture, all of which are illusory. And they all follow exactly uh, uh, follow exact the same pattern. If it weren't for these illusions, we probably to this day would not understand how human color <coughs> works. So illusions often result from alliance on proxies and shortcuts. And that the goal of perception is not to see the world as it is. <coughs> as I sometimes said, we see the world as we are, not as it is. We want to have a model in our minds of what the world is outside that correlates with the world out there, not resembles it. After all, when we look at a red object and we see red, it's just that certain neurons are firing in our brain. They're not red. There's no light in the brain at all. We experience it as red. That is an illusion, but one that is not missing. So thank you for your attention. That, uh, that extraordinarily rich experience, there's going to be some questions. So we're going to take just a, maybe five minutes for questions, and then you can continue out at the reception if you haven't gotten your question answered. And I'm going to ask Jim, will you take your own questions? And I think we're not going to run the mics up to you because of time constraints, so speak loudly. And one of us will try to repeat the question because we are videotaping this, so we want to make sure to hear your question, okay? Fire away. So, are there uh, creatures that have only two colors? Maybe we have three in this room. Yeah, there are probably a few in this room. Uh, they're called diaphragmats. Um, as I mentioned, they're short, medium, and long wave sensitive cones. If you're missing one of those, you probably have uh, red green color. <coughs> You can, but are there creatures that are going to have Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, the, the evidence, the, most creatures that are not quite dramatic. Uh, basically, if you look at a species of animal that's colored, like birds and fish, you can pretty much guess they're going to have color vision. So that's, they use that to recognize the members of their own species. And uh, organisms that don't have color, much less likely to. Cats and dogs were once thought to be colorblind. In fact, they're not colorblind, they're just color of specs, color different. And they're not that different from um, uh, humans who are either missing one of the three cone types and therefore are dichromats, or they're so called anomalous trichromats. Don't, don't call it like that. <laughs> uh, but anomalous trichromats have all three cone types, but have an odd pigment in one of them. So if you get into arguments like with your partner or something over whether something is green or blue, there's a very good chance that they simply have different pigments or are missing pigments. And it's not that they're seeing the same thing as you, but perniciously they aren't imminent. Instead, they just see the world differently. And it's not that you're right and they're wrong, or vice versa. You're both wrong. And the pigment will tell you something. Yes. The experience of where you change the person asking for direction as a goal Are there certain things that are so basic the big three, age, gender, and race. Uh, beyond those three, the changes are hardly ever noticed. It's amazing. If you, if you want a lesson in humility, try it yourself. You're talking to something you know, and 
have your friend next to you substitute for you and find out how often people are it's, it's really extraordinary. And you might say, well, why don't we know how bad we are at this? Well, you don't know what you don't know. Um, when we are blind to something, we are as blind to it as we are to our own blind spots. How would you ever see your blind spot? Because you need something to see it with. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a puzzle to work through. Yes, it's a, it's a pretty robust phenomenon. And uh, Ben Simons has a book out now about uh, change blindness. There are some demonstrations. Uh, if you Google uh, Daniel Simons, you'll see some ones that are just as powerful as the ones I showed you today. And if you've not seen them before, uh, it will be fresh and uh, they'll, they'll work really well. One of them, the first one I ever saw, is a picture of a jet airplane taken right on the tarmac in front of the jet. And it flashes, boom, boom, boom. And in every other flash, this big, huge jet engine disappears from underneath one of the wings. And as soon as somebody points that out to you, you say, oh my god, how could I possibly miss that? But we all do. They're all 80, 90 percent of us will miss something as soon as like that. Uh, and so Simon's problem is that he has to keep coming up with new demonstrations <laughs> because people are suspicious and they're looking out at it. But just like the cornfield whose right hand row disappeared. The cornfield was, uh, that, that one worked pretty well with me, even though I knew what the deal was going on.
Where are the other forms? Okay, people are clues. <laughs> it's the kind of item that can appear, in fact, they appear on IQ tests. Mental box unfolding, the kinds of problems that can drive some people totally nuts, or other people are better at it. And so what we're trying to come to terms with, what does it actually mean to create a visual image? Uh, Kekulé famously discovered the benzene ring by having a dream when snakes chase each other around in a circle and end up forming the structure of the uh, so the benzene ring. Uh, many famous scientific discoveries have been based upon these sort of instantaneous insights coming from images. But we don't really know what an image is. Uh, and so I'd say it's a work in progress. Uh, Landon Lamb did a lot of work on color. Yes. Representing colors in different ways. How is that connected to the system? Edwin Land is the, the inventor of the Polaroid Land camera. Uh, the, uh, people in this room never seen one, but it was a big deal back in the day. Um, also, had a theory of how color vision works called the Retinex theory that actually has the ability to explain certain kinds of phenomena that can't be explained by. Young Helmholtz trichromatic theory or the sort of Harry and Young color process theory. There are different theories that deal with different stages of vision. But essentially, his, one, his was based on sort of intelligent factoring in of. of um, well, let me give you an, an example. Uh, he dealt with images like Mondrian paintings. Uh, Mondrian paintings, those of you who may remember Deborah Sobolini's wonderful talk showing ways in which you could do evolutionary art with uh, Mondrian paintings. But Mondrian paintings have sort of a, a grid or patchwork structure with a bunch of different colors in it. And by looking at the uh, wavelengths that are present all the way across the image, you can make inferences about the source of illumination. That, in other words, if there's a certain wavelength that's present all the way across the Mondrian painting, it's probably not in the painting is probably in the light shining on the paint. And that this is the idea about how we perceive colors correctly even though we put on green sunglasses. That ought to totally wreck our ability to judge colors accurately. But if you think about it, putting those color glasses on has an effect on every pixel, so to speak, in our field of view. And if you're able to do the calculations correctly, you could probably come out with a pretty good educated guess as to the, the color or the tint of the aluminum, and then you're off to the races. Land had a bunch of other, Land, Land had a proposal for 3D television back in the 1970s. It never took off, uh, but it actually, he demonstrated it actually was working. So now, finally, for better or worse, we actually have 3D TV. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to, because we've taken 10 minutes and for questions, and I know you have many more. Uh, this was just such a, a fabulous presentation, and I know that most of us think very differently about vision coming out of this talk than when we came in. So please, come out to the reception, talk some more with, with Jim Pomerantz, and enjoy some discussion among yourselves. And thank you all so much.